Yeah, Nadia, whenever you want. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation to talk um, to you today. It gives me an opportunity to retake my data about Lima Barreto. And uh, yes, I, I, I want to stress how important I feel that Latin American study centers in UK have been for all the, uh, the, the exchange of um, scholarship and uh, our cultural diversity also. And uh, so in this sense, I want to make public my support to the Center of Latin American and uh, Caribbean Studies in uh, uh, the University of London that is now under threat of a closure, yes? Um, uh, I, I will try to be very quick in the 30 minutes and then I made a PowerPoint for you. Let me see um, if you can, if you can see, and uh, I, I will try not to read the, the quotations. And uh, I believe that maybe uh, this, uh, the Spanish speakers uh, can read uh, brief quotations in Portuguese. Okay, if you have any problem, please let me know. Um, so this uh, paper is a reading of a set of texts in fiction and chronicle written by the Brazilian novelist Lima Barreto between 1915 and 1921. Lima is certainly one of the greatest names of Brazilian 20th century literature. Uh, and he has um, many, uh, many translations, especially his most acclaimed novel, which is The Sad End of Policarpo Quaresma and short stories like The Man Who Spoke Javanese, yeah? Uh, well, um, all the, the, his work as a whole made him a referential mark for the literature of social critique in Latin America, yeah? Uh, much of which belongs to the satirical lineage of Jonathan Swift. Uh, so, uh, yet Lima Barreto's commitment to the anarchist political project of his time still awaits close attention from literary criticism, more particularly how such committee, commitment affected his aesthetical choices. Most of his liter literary fortune is pervaded by a biographical approach which tend to explain his political and aesthetical choices from the perspective of personal resentments or grievances. This still applies to his most recent biography by Lily Schwartz that states that he was an anarchist because he was a difficult character, uh, I quote, against everything, yes? My proposal, on the contrary, and maybe because I'm also a difficult character, uh, is to contemplate his work from the point of view of a history of ideas. For such, I intend to highlight Lima Barreto's interlocution with the anarchist social theory, focusing in particular the naturalist thesis which his work resonate in Brazil. For these ideas, the animal is the privileged they take. Uh, the article I bring to you uh, departs from the short story Manel Capineiro um, or Manel the Hay Catcher, uh, published in 1915 in the magazine Era Nova in Rio. And the central theme of this short story is the bond between a worker and his cargo cattle. Um, so I just want to, uh, from this quote, I want to underline the fact that Manel loves his animals, loves them tenaciously and avoids the most to hurt them with the barb that gives them the required direction. Yes, 
so this narrative is built from the small talk of a bar and converse to show the reader that the lives of animals have a central place in the lives of workers. Um, and so this conversation, uh, in the end of this conversation, his Manel says, Mr. So-and-so, if not for them, I would not know how to live. They are my bread. Another narrative mark contradicts the practical reason, though. As we saw, Manel loves tenaciously his animals, and it can be said this love is reciprocated by the animals, I quote, who so unselfishly help him to live. The outcome of this short history emphasizes affection as the central core of this relationship. And so what happens is that Manel loses his cattle for um, a train, an express train just uh, heat the cattle and kill them. And so uh, the short story uh, finishes with this Manel saying, oh my cattle, why not me? Although the short story Manel Capinero was written in 1915, its central plot was already registered in the writer's personal diary in an entry of 1907. And then he registered this, uh, this very uh, phrase, oh my cattle, why not me, uh, that he heard, yes? The date of this entry should not pass unnoticed to us because this date back it dates back to the seminal ideas of the short story in the first decade of the 20th century, when crucial biopolitical measures were taken in connection to the huge urban reform of Rio, then the federal capital. In brief, we must take into account that the official project of hygienization of, the, of Rio uh, that took place in those years, carried with it the expulsion of both animals and informal workers from the urban space. This highlights the space the short story is situated in, which depicts the indecisive border between urban and rural spaces. We must note, however, that it also argues for the great interdependence of both spaces as the town is still depended on informal labor and animal labor, such as um, coal men, hay catchers, and their asso animal associates. The conspicuous presence of animals in the life of the suburbs was indeed a theme for the most lyrical passages in Lima Barreto's work, testifying how pigs, goats, cows, chicken, and dogs shared a life with the poor people living inside their houses and being an inextricable in part of their work and leisure. Although at the first glance, his views on interspecies relationships can be understood as merely sentimental, I here argue with you that they are informed by libertarian naturalist ideas of the time, notably the notion of mutual aid. Um, so let me explain a bit what naturalism was. Uh, this was a, a minority tendency among international the Spanish Revolution. We have to distinguish, as uh, Bobejo rightly demands, uh, that naturalism in its 19th century European version was not necessarily libertarian at birth. On the contrary, humanitarian and other currents of thought under a larger romantic scope, as well the influence of medical knowledge 
recognized a natural way of life based on vegetarianism, abstinence of stimulants such as tobacco and alcohol, the use of light clothes and exercises at open air. Within the frame of anarchist movement, Tolstoyism is perhaps the most known tendency, but naturalist concepts shape different currents such as naturianism, neonaturianism, primitivism, anti-scientificism, or libertarian naturism in Southern Europe in the same period. Despite their internal differences, these tendencies characterized the naturist movement of unique libertarian type, which claimed a huge among other species. Young groupment was formed among anarchist workers in Paris in the 19, uh, 1990s. Um, as Bobeho, uh, who is a historian of the French natu uh, naturism, points out, in a period of fierce police repression toward anarchist direct action strategies, naturists were left in peace. They were said to be extravagant, but not dangerous. Indeed, the transgressive potential of their critique, not only of the industrial production of capital and science, but also what they called civilization, all human production that implied in an engineering of nature could hardly be understood in the 19th century. For that reason, Edouard Masruan defined naturalism as an anarchist ecology, even avant la lettre. Soon after took root in the Iberic Peninsula, most notably in Catalonia, where it bloomed an intense press propagation. In naturalist press certainly reached Central and South America in the very beginning of the 20th century. Uh, as we can see by the collection, collections held in Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. Most importantly, naturalist ideas arrived with the migrant workers and even entire groups of naturalists tried to establish experimental mm -hmm. communities in the hinterland of Brazil in the beginning of the 20th century. Yes, in urban spaces, um, short-lived uh, naturalist periodicals were published, especially in Rio de Janeiro during the first to the case of the 20th century. So Lima Barreto was involved uh, as uh, in these in these pro elaborated more intensively with the anarchy press in Sao Paulo and Rio in the years uh, 1910 and until uh, the, his death in 22. In this period, um, a laconic but very significant reference emerges in his correspondence with his editor, Francisco Schettino, in 1918, when he ironically states that he is available to write for free in the great press, but only about controversial issues like, and he quotes, among them, naturalism, what he called naturalism. Um, so uh, besides Lima was very well acquainted with some theoretical sources like Kropotkin, uh, Elisée Reclus and Tolstoy. Yes, um, his acquaintance, um, so I'm sorry, I forgot to show you the, the periodicals so the the first one was French. This is 
uh, Spanish, yes, it's in, uh, published in Barcelona. And this is a uh, uh, Brazilian periodical, Natalist periodical. And, and uh, so, in his first novel, Recordações do Escrivão Isaías Caiminha, uh, which uh, was published in 1908, yes, uh, he made an approach to in a, in a critic approach to the anarchist program, including the naturist premise of no exploitation of animals. And this is ironical bull versed in the following dialogue between two petit bourgeois. Uh, I will try to translate for you because it's he says, alas, madam, we are all criminals. You are too. Me, doctor, yes, for living. You have been taking the life of many people. We know that you have this dress, these ribbons, take the life of many others. Our life only develops with great violence on things, on the animals and the equals. And you can see uh, for this, oh, uh, this, um, next, next, uh, sorry, the next slide that um, this was, um, this was published in El Naturista in 1922, exactly the same argument of Lima Barreto that has to call his animal. Yes. Um, so, uh, I just emphasize for you that much earlier uh, than the publication of Mutual Wade by Kropotkin in 1902, libertarian naturist thought sustained the unity of sentient life. And by the end of 19th century, Tolstoy, Manifest for Life, um, claims all living beings are separate by their bodies, but what gives them life is the same for all. In um, the anarchist thinker, uh, Georges Boutou summarized in La Vie Anarchiste, all that leaves constitutes my family. Uh, nevertheless, um, Mutual Wade by Kropotkin gave a theoretical corpus to these ideas and practices and uh, summarizing very um, quickly his argument, Kropotkin was debating with Huxley, with Thomas Huxley, um, about the survival of the fittest. But Kropotkin accepts the Darwinian uh, premise of the survival of the most fit, but he Nadia? Morgan on the American beaver, Kropotkin uh, maintained that Muta Wade was a prominent factor of evolution. And so this was valid in relation to humans as well as other animals. And he came to read the primitive or peasant communities, the guild corporations of medieval cities and contemporary anarchist collectivities as mutual aid clusters that resisted and changed the history of power, thus building social evolution. I want to note with you that this evolutionary theory inverted the pose of social Darwinism of the time. For social Darwinism, as you know, extended nature to social categories, while Kropotkin, grounded by the notion of an extended fraternity, reads the relationships inter and intra species as a field of intense sociality, an extended network of solidarity among sentient living beings. This definition of solidarity came to be a constant reference 
a touchstone concept for Lima's, uh, Lima Barreto's writings. Um, so, um, uh, in, in 1918, uh, arguing for the militant character of all great literature, he pondered human solidarity more than anything interests the destiny of humankind, but not exclusively of humankind, as we can see in the same text, he says, um, well, as beasts of prey disappear, men, oxen and sheep conquer this world with their mutual weight. This is an open criticism to Nietzsche, uh, but the passage supports the hypothesis that mutual weight theory, the idea of a solidarity network of sentient life, when transposed to the urban and industrial ambience of workers' struggles of the beginning of the 20th century was rooted in the struggle for domestic species, whereby we can understand the libertarian struggles against vivisection, corridas de toros, slaughter, and other modalities of exploitation of domestic animal lives. The domestic animal became uh, the comrade by excellence, yes? Not, not only the romantic fellow animal, yes, but a politicized fellow that became a comrade of a struggle for life and liberty, yes? Under this light, from, from my point of view, the short story Manel Capineiro fictionalizes naturalist ideas and practices of the early 20th century, Rio de Janeiro. No wonder that Manel cried the death of his fellow animals like a mother cries for her children. And it should not pass unnoticed, a machine, an express train, implacable as fate, kills the oxen. In a manner of a fable on solidarity, Manel Capineiro encapsulates in a nutshell a critique of the forthcoming industrial capitalism. But not only this, because the narrative nucleus of Manel Capineiro, um, uh, was uh, retaken this time in a chronicle of his last years of Lima uh, last year, uh, when he was interned in the Army Central Hospital. And when he saw uh, uh, the guinea pigs for bacteriological research, he just remembered of Manel Capineiro, yes, who, uh, who cried for his, uh, his animals, yes. Uh, the confrontation of these versions of 1915 and 1919, the fiction and the chronicle, points out the change. So uh, the, the animals of the first, the first tale are replaced by Estrela and Moreno uh, for um, Manel Capineiro's animals. Such pair, Estrela and Moreno, uh, leads to another text, the chronicle The Star, or O Estrela, about a homonymous ox, published in the magazine uh, Anoichi in 1921, yeah? So the time space of the chronicle is set in the uprising of uh, the Brazilian Navy in, 19, in 1893, yes? The rebels then occupied the island where the writer spent his childhood. And so the text first describes the admiration of the child toward um, the armed man. And so uh, he told about the flashing bayonets and the admiration for weapons. But then the admiration turns into sorrow when he understands that the sailors demanded a star, the peaceful laborer ox, yes? 
And so in a long reflection about Star, he says, uh, when I understood they were going to kill him, I did not fare well. I ran home without looking back. Uh, so in a crescendo, the text invites to consider the arbitrariness and futility of the killing of a patient animal worker just because a bunch of men were hungry amidst a biology dispute of power. So the time space of the insurrection of the Navy is very significant precisely for highlighting slaughter and war, stressing their common predicate of arbitrary and futile power over life and death exerted on defenseless living beings. This was indeed a very, if not the most recurrent libertarian naturalist topos of the period between the late 19th century to the post-World War I years. In its negative form or its reverse, the positive link between vegetarianism and pacifism. Such was one of the, one of the themes in Leon Tolstoy novel, Resurrection, and also uh, sparse writings which were thoroughly disseminated by libertarian naturalist press. Most of all, it was a theme in which um, uh, Elise Reclue um, um, contemplated in his seminal article on vegetarianism. It seems that the Chronicle, the star, um, draws a parallel to this text because the argument follows the same pattern in Reclu also develops um, his argument in favor of vegetarianism departing from a painful experience of slaughter in childhood. Uh, while Lima Barreto literally ciphers the continuity from slaughter to war in the drift between a child's fascination for guns and the discovery of the bloody killing of sentient beings, Heclus' text goes further and openly uh, speaks out. It's not a subterfuge to mention the horrors of war in connection to the massacre of cattle and the carnivores' feasts, diet precisely corresponds to the individual behavior, blood calls blood. Uh, at first meaning, Heclus' consideration uh, that blood calls blood refers to the theory of substance which lays in the naturalist vegetarian code. The consumption of animals was said to have direct and dire consequences to the balance and realness of an individual as meat would excite violent passions. Meat belonged then to a matrix of unruliness as a functional equivalent to the excess of alcohol, tobacco, sex, or gambling. Uh, I will show you, this is a pamphlet in Brazil showing um, the uh, the way someone who is addicted to alcohol, tobacco, and gambling uh, will finish his days, yes? Um, unruliness certainly derived from the act of eating animals, but above all, from killing them, with this poor hunting being an extreme limit Naturist theory understood killing animals as a morally debasing act, which certainly turned a human being violent and in peril. In this vein, the naturist theory of substance was not far from other philosophical tendencies, which also preconized vegetarianism as a modality of temperance during the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th. Indeed, it sprang from renouncing religious contexts, vegetarianism in its multifolded forms, as Keith Thomas said, so properly encoded an efficient cultural refusal in Europe during the whole 19th century. 
following keystone must pass, I suggest that more than any other tendency or ideology, libertarians made vegetarianism a radical political language in the combat for the dignity of life, because in a first step from the moral predication against violence, they established a common cause with the violate bodies. This is the crucial step that forged the link between vegetarianism and pacifism and the naturist conceptual system. As Reclus dramatically summarized in his manifesto, there is not a big difference between the corpse of an ox and that of a man. The amputated members and the entrails mixed together are very alike. The slaughter of the first easy is the murder of the last. Um, so, sorry. Um, so, <laughs> Um, such a similitude, as said before, was based on the premise uh, of a political and existential unity of life, all forms of life, on, on which libertarian claimed a political alliance with domestic species. I understand this debate is present in Lima Barreto's view on the star, the labor ox, who could never raise his eyes from its work, like peasants or industrial workers also hardly could. This argument is widened in a correlate chronicle. Uh, is it a man or a yoke ox, which close in date has a strict thematic correspondence to the chronicle, the star. It works also on the episode of the rebellion of the nave. Um, and uh, when asked why uh, they were insurrecting against the central government, the sailors could not give a reason for the war. For it was not their war. The title shaped in the form of, of a question encodes the correspondence between poor men led to rising arms guided by high commanders as the oxen by a barb. This expression, prison folder, or in the evening, in the eve of World War, the First World War, canon folder was recurrent in libertarian press, openly establishing a symbolic equation between the slaughter of startled animals Yes, in the carnage of millions of soldiers in the name of the state and the capital. The refusal to give cannon fodder to the war was an important argument to the excuse of consciousness campaign and many other forms of libertarian boycott to conscription in the First World War. In the press, Lima soon took position against the war, yes. Uh, aligning with the majority of anarchists in a pacifist core. Obviously, the theme of avoidance of spilling blood has a much longer tradition that goes back to the ancient world. Nevertheless, the naturist avoidance must be understood in the light of a revolutionary project of the labor movement at the turn of the 19th century, as it poses a dilemma to strategies of revolution in general. French terror was still the counter example. Naturist critique of armed seizure of power maintains close analogy to their critique of production. Contrary to other anarchist tendencies, but also uh, other left tendencies, naturism urged for the total abolition of work, which in their view would always make slaves of all forms of life. In this very line, they also refused to resort to direct action or rise up in arms, envisaging a corrupting and endless cycle of bloodshed. Blood calls blood, yes? Uh, in this vein, naturism retakes in the 20th century the critique of violence made by romantic radicals one century before facing the French Revolution. At this point, I underline the parallel between 
The arguments by Elise Reclu and Lima Barreto to the pamphlet, The Cry of Nature, written by the revolutionary John Oswald, the Scotsman, the Scotsman who died in the Vendée defending the French Republic, quoting Ovid, um, what more advance can mortals make in sin so near perfection, who will with blood begin? Um, John Oswald ponders that hardly when used to killing will distinguish, I'm quoting, distinguish the vital tide of a quadruped from that which flows from a creature with two legs. Are the dying struggles of a lamb king less affecting than the agonies of any other animal, whatever, he asks. On the eve of World War I, pacifism was not an unanimous cause among libertarians, yes? Um, mainly due to Kropotkin's position of tactical support for the Allies. But at the other pole, naturalists by the side of other libertarian tendencies supported the conscious objection, yeah? And this is where we, we find Lima Barreto. When historicized, the chronicle, the stars and its pendants uh, constitute Lima Barreto's reflection on pacifism in the, con in the context of World War, the First World War and its consequences, the code of solidarity or mutual aid in the short story Manel Capineiro belongs to the same matrix, bringing to the fore the broad libertarian perspective that pacifism necessarily encompasses interspecies relationships. And then vegetarianism is pacifism uh, extended to other species. This set by the side of other fiction and chronicle composes uh, a naturally sweet by Lima Barreto where we can envisage a political statical project central to his work. The great lines of such statical program were already established by Reclus in 1980, in 1898. And he says, we contort ourselves in repose for the engineer who disfigured nature, imprisoning a waterfall in iron pipes, we contort in repose for the Californian woodsman who fell of 4,000 years and sent 100 meters high tree just to exhibit its rings in fairs. The naturalist Lima Barreto would not disagree. His work decidedly aligns with the small lives against the modernist machine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Nadia. Uh, unfortunately, we kind of clap. So this is the, the end of these talks uh, via Zoom. Um, you can use the virtual the virtual uh, button, of course. So it's, it's a bit dry, but it's a fascinating talk. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure everybody really enjoyed it. I, I I'm, certainly I'm did. Yeah. Um, I'm... <laughs> so what, what we can do now is have a, a round of questions and, and discussion and um, perhaps just to make sure that I don't miss anybody if you could use the option to raise your hand because otherwise I cannot see all the all, all the participants at once so um, and remember to uh, you can unmute you, you can unmute yourself by pressing the space uh, option or, or you can also find it uh, on, on the top right hand side uh, and if you don't want, if you want the recording to stop while you make a question, and you, of course, that's perfectly fine. Yes. Yeah? So I don't know who wants to start. Who has a question? Uh, Lucia. You need to unmute yourself, Lucia. Uh, I'm using a phone, so I'm a bit, yeah. Uh, Nadja, this is an it was an amazing talk. I think it's so refreshing. First of all, it was so beautifully done. And secondly, um, 
it's so refreshing to see a reading of Lima Barreto that, uh, as you said, goes away, moves away from his, uh, uh, fr from the usual biographical tone of, of the reading. So this was amazing. It's great. Very, very, very nice. Um, I have a couple of questions. One of them goes a bit back to the biographical, just to contradict myself. And it is, um, I mean, we don't have to, to, to get into the biographical to, to know that uh, race was a very important issue in Lima Barreto's work. So uh, is, is there any way that um, those issues, the libertarianism uh, and, and the, the, the libertarianism, as you put it, and, um, and his love and, and compassion and, and uh, you know, for, for the animals uh, and respect for, for all life can, can uh, somehow, you know, be interpreted together or, or is there any connection between those readings? I'm not putting this very well. Uh, and the, the, the other question I had was, um, is Lima Barreto, as in so many cases, he seems to be a lonely voice at that time in Brazil, or is he part of a, of a, a bigger movement uh, and in, in this particular issue of libertarianism and, and uh, vegetarianism and, and respect for animals? Uh, and, and if so, who are the other writers? that belong to this movement. I guess this has a connection with your larger project. How, how are you seeing this project? Is in, in, you know, within a broader view of Lima Barreto or Lima Barreto and other uh, authors? Sorry, I spoke too much already. Thank you. Um, so, hi, Lucia, thank you so much. Hi. Good questions, yes. Lovely to see you. Um, well, first of all, um, yes, how to conciliate other uh, concerns uh, of Lima Barreto's work, like uh, the racial concern to, um, to his anarchism. And I think that, um, yes, um, there are some chronicles now. I don't have I don't have the the reference for you, but he expli explicitly <laughs> explicitly um, discuss uh, racism in the racial matter. You know because um, um, uh, the um, racist scientificism was at rise, yes, and um, saying that uh, the right race was superior, things like that. And he stops and thinks, well, um, is this true? Is this, uh, uh, are we really inferior? And his, um, his answer is from the social theory of anarchism, because it gave to him um, a good barricade um, to combat uh, racism also, but from the point of view of universal values, because anarchism was saying we are all equal, but it's not only uh, human beings, all living beings, so we, we have the same right to this earth. So I think that um, it would be as, as much is being done nowadays to put Lima as an author, as a champion for race. Um, it, it can be done, but uh, with this caveat that the, the social theory of his time is universalist. It has a universal ambition, yes? It's not... I. I don't know if I am clear, but it is an chronic to read him from the point of view of um, identity politics of the present, because this was not what Lima was doing in the beginning of the century. And uh, uh, I don't know if I, I answer your question. The second one, yes, um, it's strange because um, 
Lima was an anarchist, and I think that his aesthetics was anarchist. Um, much of his writings that are considered unfinished by the literary critics like Sergio Bartolanda or others, they were done in a fabula, an allegoric narrative that was typical of anarchist literature of the time because it had a didactic purpose. Uh, so the war, all the anarchists writing at the time in Rio, in Sao Paulo, there is a, a good volume prepared by, um, edited by uh, Francisco Foot Hartman and Anoni Prado, anarchist short stories. And I asked Foot, uh, Foot Hartman, why didn't you put Lima Barreto there? And he said, oh, he's too good to be with the, with the other anarchist writers, you see? He's an icon of our literature. So he stays in a limbo um, because of this refusal to put him in the anarchy set. This is what I, I think. That's why also this is important because, you know, uh, all this critic from Sao Paulo and all this, um, all this mania, I don't know if it makes sense to our colleagues, but all this um, obsession that literary criticism in Brazil has with the, the movement of the Semana of 22, the 22 uh, Art Week, yes? Um, they always read Lima Barreto was, oh, he's a precursor of modernism. He is not exactly a modernist. He's not, well, what I understand is that he is refusing modernism because modernism is the statical current of the industrial time. And he is refusing this as, you know, at tout court. He doesn't want to be <laughs> to be part of a modernist movement. Yes, uh, it's not because he is unaware, and he is very much aware, writing against all the people of the of that in São Paulo were involved with the with the Semana de 22, and yeah against the Claxon and periodical, he was saying, we don't want anything to do with this. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I, I, I answer you. Do you thank you for your questions, Lucia? Oops, you answered yeah. very well. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yes. And <laughs> I think it's a brilliant reading of Lima. It completely changes the way that Lima is seen. In, in Brazilian, uh, the history of Brazilian literature, completely right that way. Wow. Very, very, very I'm really exciting. Vain. No, you can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pete, uh, you had a question, right? Yeah, no, I really enjoyed that too. <clears throat> and I thought it was very interesting to see the way in which um, vegetarianism and pacifism and anti capitalism and um, anarchism and so on, all linked together in this early 20th century conjuncture. Um, I was interested in the use of the word libertarian, libertarianism, because nowadays, I anyways, it's probably just my ignorance, but I associate that word with quite a kind of right wing agenda. You know, libertarians now are people who are in the Conservative Party or they're people who support uh, Trump and Johnson and, and these other kind of very right wing politicians because they see the, you know, liberty as being the liberty to engage as a, um, to do what you want in the free market world. So you engage as a free market person and you take responsibility for your actions. And if you want to smoke or if you want to drink, <clears throat> if you want to eat loads and loads of sugar, that's your business, you're responsible for your actions. Whereas here, it seems like, you know, that's a, it, it has a rather different um, connotation to it. So I was wondering whether um, you think the kind of conjuncture of vegetarianism, pacifism, anarchism, anti-capitalism and so on, that is characteristic of this particular period and maybe this particular you know, region of the world, in what sense is that different from similar kinds of conjunctures that we see now 
in which you you know you anti globalization movements are maybe linked to vegetarianism or more you know possibly veganism now as well um you know is there something different going on now than then well uh thank you thank you i think that these are uh, much of my concerns too about the libertarian uh, term libertarian uh, in the end of the 19th century, or in the mid 19th century on, until the Spanish Revolution, it was uh, uh, a term just applied to anarchist movement. So I just, how do I say this? I take, I take this term, I will not allow this right wing to use it, you know, because it's ours and uh, it belongs to, to a progressive, um, um, to a progressive field. It can't be just, you know, appropriated by them. Uh, I, I saw this confusion nowadays in some books when they come to write to anarchism, they are a bit um, shy to use the term libertarian. But I, I, I insist on this because Anarchists were the real libertarians. I cannot accept this right wing to say that they are defending liberty. Um, so they are defending other, other values, individualism and etc. Well, uh, it's okay, but uh, so I, I insist that we, we use the term and we do not give up to them. It, this is the first thing. The first thing, is, the, the second thing is that all these all these pandemics and all these that we are living make me feel that suddenly we have the proof that Western historicity is not linear at all. We are living a kind of oscillation. All the, all the, all the debates uh, that were uh, a blaze in the in in the turn of the century, yes, on in the turn of the 20th century, are back with all misfortunes as well, like the rise of fascism. Yeah, while we are discussing vegetarianism, pacifism, and etc., um, the right wing is just brewing their most horrible, somber face. Yes, mm. uh, so. Uh, Yes, uh, I think I, I can see um, a lot of not only similitude, but a lot of identity of these debates in social movements like um, vegans or Extinction Rebellion um, uh, and even um, anarcho-punks, they are, they are all bringing back um, the thesis of the turn of the century, sometimes with no uh, no consciousness, no uh, of this link, mm. uh, they they don't know they have a history. Yes, that this these ideas did not came out of the blue; they were there. Uh, that's why. But it, it's amazing because they were not only there in the turn of the 20th century, but they were there in the turn of the 19th century, yes. Shelley was a naturalist. He was vegetarian, he was nudist, he was, yeah. And uh, oh, and uh, so John Oswald, Burns and Shelley. So that's why I think that we need, we need to think about a genealogy of ideas mm. that come today, yes. Um, Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, can I just thank ask um, something else, Ignacio? Yeah, um, I mean, this is something that I guess isn't very particular to to uh, the libertarian naturism that you're talking about, but is a, is a kind of, you know, a constitutive or a, a problem at the heart of um, of the kind of vegetarian philosophy or something that, that doesn't see the um, boundaries between humans and, and animals, which is you know what are the limits of um, of responsibility? You know, if if, li if libertarianism is about taking responsibility for yourself and doing what you like, and so on, and being free to do what you want, who? 
and but you see yourself in relationship with non-human animals who don't necessarily have that kind of sense of responsibility or the, the same kind of agency that humans have then who takes responsibility for the animals do they take responsibility for themselves what how did the, the naturist that you're talking about see animal agency as opposed to human agency and at what point did they see a difference between human ah. rights and animal rights i see no they didn't see i think that departing from who saw um even from montaigne uh, and uh, la Boissie, they were thinking about the the unity was the sentient being the living being so they thought about a world where all the species could live together. So this idea of return to nature was not a metaphor. They were proposing that in many texts they say, well, look, if nature, because the only order that an anarchist should obey was nature, okay, natural order. Mm -hmm. And so uh, nature um, gave gave the necessary tools for all species to fight against um, odd oddities, yes? That, that must be the same to us. We don't need technology to face nature. We have to live with the same, with just what, you know, what nature gave us, hands and feet and, you know. Uh, so they were, they were talking seriously about this. Mm. about equal, equal rights. So many went to communities, yes? They made communities in, in, uh, in suffered wild spaces. Uh, in Brazil, there were many experiments, but also uh, there is, until nowadays, there is uh, um, a community in the Italian part of Switzerland, uh, it's called Ascona, um, and and so they they had these communities in uh, in in all Europe, yeah, in urban space. In the, uh, when you talk about industrial workers that could not just leave for communities, yeah, um, they were fighting the struggles for animals. For instance, in 1904, in the beginning of the year, there was, um, uh, how do you say this? Cart drivers strike in mm. Rio, yeah? And the first thing they, they did, the first action of the strikers was to go there and break down the cart that took um, stray dogs in oh. the street. Yeah, they broke all this cart and liberate the stray dogs and the, they liberate the donkeys. They um, and they were Portuguese. Most of them were Portuguese anarchists. They came uh -huh. from, from Portugal. Yeah. So they were fighting struggles against vivisection, against uh, Corrida de Toros, against, you know, all this kind of exploitation. Um, there is a Argentinian historian, uh, Christian Ferrer. He talks about invasions of slaughterhouses, the breaking of um, um, the place where they sell meat. Um, how do I say this in English? But the butchers, the butchers. The butcheries, yes, exactly. They invaded and break everything, you know, for people to learn that they should not <laughs> eat that meat, but you know they 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 try to liberate animals from the slaughterhouses, and uh, so they were serious about equal rights. Yes, mm. and they they thought that all these animals were victims, as we are, as workers are victims of capitalism. That they must be liberated. Yes. Um, so um, all these, um, all these, this idea of a return to nature, you know, in the in the thirties, it had a, a drift. Uh, in the North Europe, it became um, it became just 
a cult of the body, yes? Mm. Like go into the nature, this is nature Volker in, in Germany, that afterwards they will be taken by Nazism, yes? Mm. But uh -huh. yes, mm. they will be absorbed by Nazism. That's why conventional left-wing parties, conventional Marxists for a long time resisted to the idea of animal liberation as they saw it as a right-wing uh, plea. Yes. Mm, okay. But, yeah, it was not. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Thank you. So it's, it's a thorny issue, yes. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm conscious that it's just been more than an hour in, in on Zoom, or we cannot just extend and extend. But I I don't know if anybody has a last question. I have a question, but I'd rather give it give the option to somebody else. Lucia has her hand raised there. I don't know if she forgot to. Uh... I think that's from before. Okay, so uh, yes, it is from before. Sorry. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so yeah. then I, I have the privilege of the last question. And I'm All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's your microphone. Could you put your microphone? Yes. Yeah. Is it better now? Yes, yes. So you have to excuse me, I really don't know much about Lima Barreto, actually. I know very little. Um, but I saw that one of the quotes mentions the Kurds, the Senegalese, the Arabs, and the Gurkha, right? And he talks about how they are. Um, I, did, I didn't actually understood the quote very well, but it's about how to instill patriotic sentiments. Sorry, my dog is being a pain. How to instill patriotic sentiments and, 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 and lead them to war. So I couldn't have noticed that he's mentioning all, all of these are colonial subjects of the time, right? So I wanted to, to ask you the relationship between uh, colonialism and, and the ideas that he's exposing in these writings and, and, and how he looks at naturalism and libertarianism uh, libertarian thinking. What's the role of, of how he sees this, this element that is very current at the time, right? Colonialism. Yeah, yeah, because he mentioned- uh, Because the word, the, you, the, you, you were talking you were talking about the conscription of Gurkhs and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. um, yes, yes, of course he was aware, not uh, because colonialism as such um, will come a bit later, the literature on colonialism, colonialism, not colonial, yes, of course he was aware of the colonial um, system but colonialism uh, and a critique of colonialism, I think that will come a bit later with Franz Fanon. Uh, and I don't believe that uh, Lima knew uh, this literature, but um, uh, he, he, he was aware of, um, of imperialism, I think that, and um, he was aware of the imperial ambitions of Germany. And so he was in the, at the eve of World War, the First World War, that people were aligning, you know, and there was this discussion among the anarchist movement because um, Kropotkin allied with the allies just to defeat Germany and, uh, and the, Lima tended to follow him, but soon he, he, he broke with the allies because he, I think he was the first writer in Brazil to, to be aware of the rise of another empire, which would be the United States. And he really hated everything that came from United States. Uh, the skycrappers, the the food, and uh, uh, and he he has some passages, especially after the war, in a in a in a short story called uh, Congresso Pan Planetario, 
I refer to this in this article also, where he says, well, uh, these people, yeah, he's making a satire and said that these people, they, they start uh, buffing anytime they feel the smell of gold. Yes, their nose just, and, and, they, and, and they just to have some fun. Sometimes they, they gather together and they kill some cats with, uh, with um, batons and other arms. And obviously he's referring to lynching of Afro-descendants in, in the US. And um, it's, it's an obvious image, but he is starting in, um, in he uh, probably was on one of the first voices in Latin America against uh, the States and the presence of the United States in, in, in South America, yeah. I don't know if I answered you, but colonialism as such, I, I, I think that would be a bit uh, violent to put this in that period because, yeah, they were not discussing this as far as I, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, there's always something to to read in Lima, but I, I never saw um, any, any reflection on colonialism, yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Nadia. We, I, I'm, I think there is consensus that it was an excellent talk and a, and, and a great way for us to start our, our seminar series. And uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you everybody for coming. And we will record, we will put the, upload thank the record on, on our YouTube channel if we, if we can. And uh, look forward to seeing you all in other events that we organize in this kind of uh, remote modality. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. And uh, yes, I hope to see you soon in another seminar. Yes. Then I will be just listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.